the first, we've got that. It's the first one of, um, 19, of 2022. And uh, thank you very much for coming. And we're really hoping that this is uh, an interactive session this evening. We're really pleased you're here and looking forward to hearing from you. My name is Fiona Gochran. I'm a um, consultant psychiatrist in the South London and Maudsley Trust. And I'm also a professor of physical health and clinical therapeutics in King's College London. And I'm here because I, I am team lead for the applied informatics theme of the South London ARC Applied Research Collaboration. So this seminar is part of the Inside Research Series, the aim of which is to provide a space to exchange knowledge and experience and information and learning and ideas uh, between academics, health and social care staff, patients, service users, the public and local partners. And we're focusing on challenges that are specific to South London. Uh, this is the first seminar for this year, but there'll be two more later in the year. Um, so you'll have seen the program. And in a minute, I think now we'll have a housekeeping slide up that, I'll, I, that I will um, make sure you've, you've uh, had a look at before we move on. Uh, but I, and I might just come to that now. You, the housekeeping slides are on the, on the screen. Please mute your um, microphones during the seminar because otherwise you can get a bit of feed, feed, feedback. But do use the chat function to introduce yourself and uh, throughout. Uh, please use the name that you registered with in your Zoom profile. And then uh, there'll be breakout discussions. We'll, I think we're going to have nine groups. So please raise your hand if you have a comment and unmute, unmute when you're invited. Feel free to have your camera on or off during the breakout groups if you can have it on. It's a bit more interactive, but if you can't, you can't. Uh, but if, um, and any technical issues, there's Madeline's email address, which should, Madeline might be helpful if you could put in the chat as well uh, so that people have it. And the, if you're tweeting, uh, about uh, anything here, use the hashtag inside, hashtag inside research. So tonight we've got, you know, a lot of the team have come tonight to tell you, we're, we're telling you about the work that's really ongoing and, you know, that we're um, at lots of different stages. So we have uh, uh, different Patel and uh, uh, Catherine Barrett and Lana Samuels talking to us about the use of applied informatics to, uh, in, uh, improve physical health care, using digital tools to improve physical health care in, in a mental health trust and how we work collaboratively on that. And then we're going to have Sarah Markham and uh, Rebecca Bendayan to talk, talk to us a little bit about use, how we used applied informatics to investigate and monitor the COVID-19 response in mental health and hospital services in South London. So the two talks will be back to back and then there'll be opportunity for comments and discussion after that. And then also people can put com questions and comments in the chat functions throughout. So just a couple of words before I move on to our introductory uh, talk and introduce our first speakers. Uh, just about what is applied informatics? Well, you know, it's, it's quite simple. We have lots and lots of things happening in, in information technology. And informatics is the study of information technology and its uses. And applied informatics emphasizes its application to real world problems. So in this, setting in this context it's about evaluating the implementation and adoption of digital innovations in health and social care settings. Anything from a health app on your mobile phone to linked databases of anonymized, pseudonymized ele electronic care, health care records. And it's, it's really important that we do this collaboratively uh, and that's why the ARC is such a, a great setting for it. Uh, informatics has great potential to improve understanding and outcomes in health and care, uh, but it's also important to evaluate how, how it gets incorporated into practice. So it's, it is a big change. The implementation of digital technologies of practice in a way that's acceptable to patients, acceptable to um, the people providing care, acceptable to the public and helps and is helpful and helps us provide good care. So that's a sort of, so it's very broad, how we take information technology into the real world in the context of health and care. So you've got a few, a few different examples of that and with them uh, that we've went to earlier. And we're also uh, very pleased to have uh, Dr. Mark, my colleague, Dr. Mark Ashworth, talk to us a little bit about how, how your data is protected and minded uh, in, in this context. So our first speakers today are Mariana Pinto da Costa, who is a senior lecturer and a, uh, in King's College London and a consultant psychiatry colleague in South London and Maudsley Trust. 
and Bartek Pliska, who's a research coordinator in uh, both King's College London and South London and Maudsley. And they're going to talk to a little, little bit about applied informatics in general. Thanks, Marianne and Bartek. Evening, Thank everybody. You very much, Fiona, for the kind introduction. And I'm very pleased to be speaking today about the NIHR ARC South London Applied Informatics. So one of the great resources we have is this uh, Applied Informatics Hub, which uh, brings together resources in digital innovation in many different areas. So first, we have several projects concerning electronic health and social care records, which include not only data from London patients, from South London and Mosley NHS Foundation Trust and Kings, like Chris and Kerry databases, but also national databases such as the UK Biobank and the National Neonatal Research Database. There are also different uh, data linkages which join information from different clinical sources in a safe way and enable to join data in ways that were not done before. And recently a new hub has been set up, the Data Mind for Mental Health Informatics Research, which uh, brings together the UK's richest mental health data in a coordinated way, which is quite uh, exciting. Um, we have also a number of mobile health resources and apps to support patients' care, digital tools and virtual reality to help professionals with diagnosis, treatment and decision making. And for example, uh, Cogstack is a tool that offers near real time natural language processing of electronic health records and aims to help with timely alerts for clinicians about specific clinical concerns on a particular patient, and uh, also with the identification and recruitment of potential participants for clinical trials. Quite importantly, we have multiple opportunities for patient and public involvement with whom we collaborate very closely, and we also provide several opportunities of capacity building and training for health and social care professionals who want to improve their skills and knowledge in digital health. So that's an initial glimpse of what we do in applied informatics. And I will pass on to Bart, who will be providing you more information about some of these initiatives. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Mariana. As you can see, here is our website. Our communication team will drop you a link to the website so, our, so you'll be able to explore in more details uh, for yourself. Let's just go to one of our uh, topics that the applied Health Informatics of London is very much concerned, for instance, electronic health and social care records. And uh, researchers use them to help to identify and recruit patients to research studies. And, to, uh, and the vision here is that there's no patient left behind when it comes to clinical research and clinical trials opportunities, using data, using clinical records to uh, uh, alert people, patients, as well as clinicians about the opportunities. And the other arms look into understanding whether new ways of delivering care results in improved outcomes. Again, using big data to evaluate innovative ways of care. So please be encouraged to go to the website, explore it for yourself. The important thing is we're continuing, we continually, um, we're building our capacity continually. So please get in touch with us. If you have any ideas or any feedback, uh, you will find uh, contact details on this website too, which our communication department will share with you through the chat. Thank you very much. So thank you, Marianne and Bartek. That's a really helpful um, ground, uh, you know, setting the background for, for everybody. And I would encourage you all to have a look at the website and to ideally get involved through the patient and public uh, engagement um, page, or indeed look at developing your skills through the capacity building stage where we're putting more things on that page all the time. It's relatively new. So we're very pleased with that. We'd love to have your engagement uh, in it as much as possible throughout the course of this, of this theme. Uh, thank you both very much. And I'm now delighted to move on to our next presentation, which is from Dr. Dipin Patel, who is um, a, a psychiatrist in training at the South London and Maudsley C Senior Registrar of the South London Maudsley NHS Foundation Trust and a clinical research fellow in, in the Psychosis Studies Department in King's, and also jointly presenting with Lana Samuels and Catherine Barrett, who are really valued patient and public involvement members in our applied informatics team, and also members of the ARC South London Public Research Panel. And you're all going to tell us today about applying digital tools to improve physical health care in a mental health trust. So welcome and thank you. 
Thank you very much for the introduction, Fiona. Um, so I thought I'd just use the next 10 minutes or so uh, with uh, Lana and Catherine just to describe um, our journey in uh, applying a digital tool, uh, as Fiona said, in, in, in a real world uh, healthcare setting um, as part of a, a collaborative approach. Uh, next slide. Um, so there are various intervention development uh, frameworks that are out there in the literature. This is one that was published in 2019. We've um, adapted this slightly for uh, applied informatics tools. Um, and it's a seven stage process. Uh, and essentially, uh, I'll just go through the sort of the, the seven steps um, as we have uh, progressed this project from initial conception uh, through to planning um, the evaluation. Uh, next slide. So um, point number one, the, the clinical problem. Um, in, in this case, we, uh, in a mental health setting, um, we know that people with serious mental illnesses such as schizophrenia, schizoaffective disorder and, and bipolar affective disorder have significantly reduced uh, life expectancy. Uh, and, and that's attributable in part due to uh, chronic physical health causes, um, namely cardiovascular disease risk factors, uh, such as high blood pressure, uh, diabetes, uh, so uh, elevated blood sugars um, compared to the uh, general population. And, and that's well documented in, in the literature now. Uh, next slide. Um, so just briefly, diabetes refers to a group of uh, metabolic disorders where uh, an individual will have uh, a high blood sugar level over a prolonged period of time. Uh, and if left untreated or if that's poorly managed, um, diabetes can then lead to various longer term healthcare complications, um, including cardiovascular disease, strokes uh, and chronic kidney disease, to name but a few. Uh, and again, this is well documented in the literature now, um, the improvements to primary prevention of physical health illnesses like type 1 and type 2 diabetes in the general population, uh, they, they haven't been replicated to the same extent uh, in people with uh, severe mental illness uh, diagnoses, which, which contributes to the, the need uh, to try and target these conditions as early as possible. Next slide. Uh, we know that the prevalence of diabetes is somewhere in the region of two to three times higher in uh, individuals with schizophrenia. Uh, compared to the general population. Uh, and as I said, there's therefore a need, and has been a need for some time for uh, research into more targeted and, and clinically informed interventions, such as applied informatics, uh, to try and improve the standard of physical healthcare uh, screening and interventions that are offered uh, to this cohort of patients, both in the primary uh, as well as secondary care uh, setting. So that's, that's the clinical problem in, in a nutshell. Next slide. So how do we address this clinical problem? Uh, and, and so this takes us to, to the start of the journey. Um, and, and I suppose the overall research question is, can uh, applied informatics, can digital tools uh, be applied to help improve the standard of, in this case, diabetes care uh, in a secondary mental health care setting? Next slide. Um, so as part of the planning stage, so step two, uh, right at the start of this project, which goes back two and a half, three years or so, uh, we, we formed a multidisciplinary team with various relevant stakeholders across different settings. Um, so that included NHS clinicians and academics uh, in psychiatry and diabetes, uh, the pharmacy department. Uh, we had involvement from the um, NHS Trust Digital Clinical Systems team, so that was the software developers, digital safety officer, information governance teams, uh, and the uh, chief clinical information officer at the Trust. Uh, we had involvement from the health informatics team at King's College London, so again a combination of software developers uh, as well as academics at, at the university. Uh, we had uh, PPIE involvement, um, and we're lucky to have Catherine and Lana uh, join us today um, and I'll come to them in a second and finally we had uh, implementation science so again academics at the university involved uh, with, with expertise specifically in evaluating interventions. Um, so uh, Lauren and Catherine I'll just pass over to you um, if you wanted to, to bring anything uh, in at this point. Yes um, I'm Lana and I would like to go ahead and say new tech new digital technology can be used as an early intervention screening tool to improve patient care and our outcomes. We have been working with Dr. Dippen since the grassroots planning stage. We have been refining, providing feedback, seeing changes being implemented as well as amendments. All of us want improved healthcare and prevention and or early detection is vital towards better outcomes for all. A digital platform will help us achieve this. Thank you. 
Yeah, I've just got a few more things to say. Important to get early intervention and improved screening for this um, cohort of patients uh, and monitoring in this project um, has uh, improved their care and how it leads to better outcomes for the patients. The researchers always thank me after a session when I've given my um, opinions. And I think PPI um, is important for the researchers because we, you get a diverse perspective. After consulting with service users, the researchers often change their proposals. So I think, you know, digital, as Lana just said, digital is the way forward for lots of people now. And uh, it'll all be linked up with AI in the future, I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana and Catherine. Uh, next slide. Uh, so um, you heard uh, Fiona talk earlier about Cogstack. Uh, Cogstack is a, a software platform which um, uh, is able to read data within the electronic health record. Uh, and at its most simple level, data in electronic health records can either be a combination of structured um, data, so that's numbers, for example, blood tests, uh, blood test results, uh, or unstructured data. So that could be, f that's that's free text. So let um, uh, reports, clinical letters, uh, progress notes, uh, etc. cetera. Um, and, and we harness the ability of Cogstack to uh, read the electronic health record, specifically um, structured data. Uh, next slide. Uh, in order to um, provide uh, real-time decision support to clinicians uh, in the secondary mental health care setting. Uh, and this can be done by a variety of ways, um, identifying patients at high risk, um, identifying uh, early treatment options. So for example, um, suggestions for evidence-based um, interventions for diabetes care uh, and prioritizing uh, patients de dependent on, on the level of need. Um, and the literature, uh, there is quite a lot of evidence out there that electronic clinical decision support systems such as this uh, can improve um, care and prevention and management of chronic conditions um, in, uh, in a variety of settings. Next slide. Uh, so just briefly, um, as I said, COGSAC is able to read the uh, data within the electronic health record. Uh, we have given um, uh, from the clinical side, various evidence-based algorithms, which are um, in line with NICE and local uh, evidence-based guidelines. Uh, COGSAC can then pick up data or missing data from the health record relating to diabetes um, blood test results. It can then provide alerts directly to the clinical uh, care team uh, electronically. Uh, and that can be via email uh, through the trust account or uh, directly to the electronic health record when a clinician accesses it. Next slide, please. Uh, so essentially the process at, at the top here uh, in simple terms is um, what should be happening and what does happen. Um, patients admitted to the ward, a diabetes screen is done, uh, other relevant information is looked at, and, and this is where Cogstack really kicks in. Uh, if there is a missing diabetes screen, for example, uh, an alert can then be generated uh, and sent out to the, the clinicians looking after that specific patient, and hopefully that can then serve to optimize uh, screening rates. Uh, and in addition, um, once a result is available, again, in line with the evidence-based guidelines, um, uh, optimal evidence-based um, care can be suggested to the care clinicians. Uh, Decision-making is not overridden. Uh, discretion still lies with the clinician, but the idea is to uh, support clinicians um, in adhering to the guidelines as best as possible. Next slide. So in terms of the design considerations, uh, there, were th there were sort of three uh, key principles here, three R's. That is that the right information is sent to the right person at the right time. It's embedded within workflows. There's accurate and timely information. It's relevant to the patient and that there's a manageable, manageable number of alerts so as to reduce um, clinicians being bombarded with too much uh, information. Next slide. Uh, so this is just a, a, a brief overview of the prototype. And, and as I said, we worked with various software developers um, over the last two years or so. Uh, this is uh, the alerting platform uh, prototype version, which is linked into the health record. Where, when a clinician logs in, um, they can then see relevant information uh, for the patients that they're looking after, and they can click into it, and then that can provide further um, evidence-based support to them uh, regarding diabetes care. Next slide. 
Uh, in terms of the next steps, um, so step five is, is about refining and validating. So that's a continuous development process, regular meetings with that wide stakeholder group that I mentioned at the start, validation work to ensure that this novel system uh, works as expected, um, and involvement from NHS Digital Clinical Safety uh, to get the um, approvals and sign off um, in, in good time. Next slide. Step six, um, and this is the stage that we're at at the moment, actually. Um, so describing the digital tool in more detail, uh, the development and design process, uh, and then um, publishing that so that other users uh, and groups can, can benefit from that um, architecture that has been worked on thus far. We've currently got a paper under review. Next slide. And finally, step seven, uh, which is um, the evaluation stage, uh, which uh, in our case, we're going to be running a pilot. Um, so a randomized trial conducted in the inpatient mental health ward setting. Uh, we'll be using wards as a unit of recruitment, assigning them either to the intervention arm, so access to the system, and then we'll have a control group, which is treatment as usual, access to paper guidelines. Uh, we're hoping to recruit four wards uh, and then run the intervention study over four months in total. Um, recruiting in this case clinician end users, uh, although there is a possibility in future uh, for data to be sent out to patients as well. Uh, and we're currently at the recruitment stage for this right now. Next slide. So in terms of the pilot, the, the primary outcomes will be uh, relating to, at this stage, acceptability and feasibility to clinicians. Um, we'll be looking at secondary outcomes, including um, the impact on process of care. So does this system improve screening rates for diabetes? Does it uh, lead to changes in prescribing of diabetic medication? Does it lead to a change in referral rates for lifestyle change interventions related to diabetes, such as smoking cessation? Uh, we'll be getting some feedback from our users. So that's pre and post surveys and interviews. Um, on the recruited boards, and then we'll be conducting a, uh, a thorough implementation evaluation uh, using various frameworks um, to formally evaluate uh, the implementation of this uh, product. Next slide. So in summary, um, I think applied informatics tools uh, have the potential to really improve clinician-led management um, of diabetes, but also other physical health conditions uh, in, in patient mental health care settings. If we find evidence of feasibility and acceptability, then in combination with the results of the implementation evaluation, we can hopefully refine the system, address any issues uh, and, and barriers to its use, uh, and then hopefully scale up um, in, in, in future work uh, in the form of larger studies where we can actually assess the impact on clinical outcomes. Um, and as I said, a, a collaborative approach really is key right from the very start uh, to, in, in order to optimize the chances of success um, of an applied informatics tool. Um, so um, I appreciate it's, it's 10 minutes, it's a very short amount of time to get through, uh, but that just gives you an overview of our journey. Uh, and also just quickly to acknowledge that there is a huge team involved. I'm just one of those research members. So thank you to everyone else who's uh, listed there. Uh, and that's the funders. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lana, Catherine, and Dippen. Beautifully presented. We've uh, a lot of work to do. It is all about the implementation and how how feasible and acceptable that is in practice. So we've had some very nice questions in the chat, and hopefully there'll be some more questions in a minute. But we'll move on first to our next presentation. Take all the questions together. So I'm delighted to welcome now uh, Dr. Rebecca Bandayan, and Dr. S uh, who is an MRC NIHR visiting, uh, sorry, research fellow in the NIHR Maudsley BRC a, a Biomedical Research Centre in King's College London, and along with Dr. Sarah Markham, who's visiting with a researcher in King's College London as well. And thank you both for coming and telling us about your, the project here, which has been using applied informatics to investigate physical health and COVID the COVID-19 response in mental health and hospital services in South London. So relevant to our local care and to the rather tough couple of years we've just been through. I'm looking forward to hearing from both of you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the introductions. And I'm very pleased to also present with Sarah that um, besides like being doctor also, the field, she's a patient representative with the ERC and member of the Cox Tech Oversight Committee and has a lot of experience of participating in various research data request committees. So I think I'm very honored to share it with her. And also I want to start with saying that actually I'm happy to present on behalf of a lot of uh, other research patients and everybody that was involved in the 
the research that I'm going to go through as fast as I can, <laughs> uh, because it was definitely a collaborative effort. Um, next slide, please. So a bit uh, on um, starting on the context, and also I'm going to try to um, put all our journey together and how we ended up being in a great place, unfortunately, but fortunately, to respond to the COVID-19 emergency. So on one side, a lot of work done in the um, biostatics and health informatics department was already trying to look at uh, multimorbidity. Multimorbidity is mainly uh, having more than two con physical health conditions. And uh, most population in over 65 are known to have two or more conditions, but actually, uh, next slide, please. Actually, uh, there has been a lot of research that in a more socioeconomic disadvantaged population or ethnic minorities, younger populations are already having an uh, increased number of physical health conditions. And this has been highlighted by NICE, by all the NHS, that is uh, something that we had to tackle. And it's a challenge for our healthcare system. Next slide, please. And I'm... I'm not sure if Sarah is, um, is so I don't know if there was some technical issues if she's here to join. She, is Sarah? I'm not, I'm not sure, did Sarah manage to get on the call? I think she was having some technical issues earlier. Um, might you be able to just carry on for the moment, Rebecca? Oh, yeah, sure. Thank you very much. And, and oh, then- we're gonna do is we, uh, Madeline, you might keep an eye out for Sarah and let Rebecca know if she can, if she manages to get in. Okay, thank you. Let's we will pass her slides and then maybe at the end if she joined, we come back. And uh, next slide, please. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Okay, so I'm gonna try to follow. Um, so in um, basically we were doing all this. Uh, work thinking about multimorbidity for the last four or five years. That is like those, and the interaction between physical health conditions and mental health conditions. And uh, we definitely had, uh, we were in a very valuable circumstance that we counted with all the platform of Coxstack and everything that was developed already. And Chris, uh, which is like, next slide please, is, um, Chris is a system already in place in the South London and Maudsley Hospital that provides mental health services that allows and facilitates to do research um, and in a very safe environment. So this is like a snapshot and we can talk later and actually Sarah knows also a lot about the process to actually have um, uh, how the process is done to ensure patient privacy and also patient involvement. Next slide, please. So when we were working about um, trying to understand how physical health um, comes um, into the interaction with mental health for patients in mental health services, we started very interested at looking at um, in, Population with severe mental illness, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders. Next slide, please. And uh, we did a lot of work to extract data from the clinical notes. So a lot of data that comes in the mental health services comes in text records as Pippin already mentioned. And uh, we worked collaboratively to actually extract a number of conditions as you can see there, and that there is that paper published that anybody can access and we can later talk. And we made a lot of effort to extract conditions as hypertension, also diabetes, epilepsy, asthma in this population. And we found that actually uh, the most frequent conditions in individuals and patients with severe mental illness are diabetes, hypertension, and asthma. So that was one thing. Next slide, please. And we also actually were able to, because there is such a variety and diversity in ethnic uh, population in South London, to find out whether there were some specific uh, 
minorities that had a higher prevalence, for example, you can see there is like a higher, higher prevalence for diabetes in South Asian population with bipolar disorder and so on. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, we were doing all this work already <laughs> and uh, uh, COVID happened. I don't think I have to tell a lot about what happened. Next slide, please. And a lot of questions rose and we were like all a bit on the blind thinking, what can we do? Next slide, please. And thanks to all, a lot of effort that Stephen was mentioning also, already that COXAC was in place, a lot of uh, the position health informatics team and in IHR connections and everybody already working together, we had real world data in real time, which actually helped us a lot to try to answer the very fast questions that were coming related to COVID. And we had already done all that work to extract uh, data like on physical health from clinical notes. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, at that time, it was, um, you all remember it, but from a research perspective, we were all very uh, trying to help. What can we do? And we were already talking directly with King's Health Partners and patients were coming into the hospital and there comes some questions that just arise and we were very lucky to be able to help from the biostats, health informatics with all the tools in place. And um, some of the first questions that happened, for example, were are antihypertensive drugs safe for COVID-19 patients? And we had like a very fast trying to respond to that question to help clinicians. And I'm just like snapshotting some of the papers that came out of it. Um, so yeah, we said, okay, yes, those are safe. Um, next slide, please. And then um, as the weeks passed, and this is actually weeks, uh, there was some concern that whether there were any ethnic differences in COVID-19 hospital admission risk and that were raised by clinicians. And that allows us also to do some work. Next slide, please. That was published a bit later, obviously, but to start seeing what was happening. And actually it was very interesting regarding of, uh, on diversity because they, we found that um, individuals that had a, came from a black minority descent or mixed or others had actually a higher risk of admission in, at hospital. But um, next slide, please. Um, when we looked at, for example, in hospital mortality, because there was this like feeling that maybe they were at higher risk of uh, death. Actually, there was an Asian population with a much more higher risk of in hospital mortality. So that allows to answer that second question. Next slide, please. And so on. And I'm going to go fast through the slides and I'm very happy to answer questions later. There were like all the questions arising. So how can we improve the current admission guidelines that were at the time uh, and the new early warning um, signs that I will just talk in a second, to identify better individuals at greater risk using blood biomarkers data. Next slide, please. So what was being used at the time was heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen saturation, respiration temperature, and what we thought, let's see if we could use the blood samples to improve it. Next slide, please. And this I'm not gonna go through, but just like, the whole idea is that we started in KCH and we validated in a lot of other um, hospitals. Next slide, please. And we looked at severe COVID disease at 14 days after hospital administration. And we actually took into account all the demographics we had at the time, the comorbidities. And actually all this was very, only we could do it because we had on place all the infrastructure. Next slide, please. And we include all those parameters. Next slide, please. And we ended up with an improved, uh, which by now it's much more improved, but at the time, <laughs> the improved um, um, criteria for admission uh, that included not only uh, some of those news too, but also neutrophil count and other blood biomarkers. Next slide, please. And so on, we kept on. And uh, this is just to make like an example of how valuable all this uh, technical 
parts that were done isolated, and maybe for other reasons at that time came together to help. And we, another question then we kept thinking is, could we stratify patients not only based on their baseline data on the biomarkers, but also the first few days that they were in the hospital? Next slide, please. And we identified actually six classes of uh, COVID patients at hospital. Next slide, please. And we had like one big one that's like a typical COVID-19 response, then a Another smaller of around the 10% that were older patients that were uh, having a very rapid hyperinflammatory response. Then we had another class of, and that's actually class two that were very old, had a bit, were the ones that had the highest mortality risk. A class three that also were having that inflammatory response but didn't end up having that great mortality risk. Next slide, please. And then we had other two classes that had renal injury. And very interestingly, we could see also from an ethnicity perspective that actually, for example, there was a class that was 66% of um, Black, Asian, and other minority ethnic background that had that risk. Next slide, please. Um, and I think I went through all kind of like snapshots, but uh, I hope I visualize how everything that was already in place uh, helped. The, there was patient um, groups that were already in COX, that's the patient and uh, public involvement groups that informed for the research in COVID, the ones in nature uh, in Atslam, and everything came together amazingly to help to provide that response. I don't know if Sarah is around to pick up on her. I think she hasn't been able to get back in. So I think we probably do need to go on, but just to, to, to highlight, I, um, I, I, I got a comment and you're talking a second to Rebecca, but Sarah has been very involved in this throughout. There's a very strong patient and, and public engagement voice in the whole Cogstack and Chris programs, and you know, very uh, hugely important in driving this. And so, uh, just to acknowledge all the work she's done on that, and indeed in this presentation, time-wise, we do need to move on to the to the discussion at this point. But I I do want to. Um, Thank you for um, explaining yours and Sarah's work so well, uh, but also to acknowledge the work of you and your team. It was incredibly pressured. You, you took the information we, that, that was available, um, answered the, the, the important questions that were there and fed them back to decision makers as soon as possible. So there's been a string of papers that you've given us a really good uh, quickly, quick run through, showing the potential inequality, showing the outcome, showing the different courses that people followed and incredibly useful information and has left us in a better position to um, hopefully um, inform care and prevent deterioration down the line. So thank you very much. Uh, on that. Now we need to go to the questions. Has, uh, if, uh, if people would like to um, put up their hand to ask a question um, themselves, or we can take some questions from the chat if people prefer. I can, um, I, and please let me know if I miss hands that are going up, but I don't see any here immediately. So I'll go um, straight to, uh, I'll probably work a little bit backwards and give a question for you, Rebecca, and indeed for you too, Dippin. Uh, organizations are not always good at, um, at collecting ethnicity and demographic information. And how much is that a factor in the accuracy of these sorts of studies? And will it be even more important moving forward? So that's a very good question. Rebecca or Dippin, do you want to um, comment well, on that? I think it's it's a great it's a great point a because uh, in, uh, in I don't know and I don't know what's Dippin's experience and I'm very intrigued to hear so, but uh, on. Our experience working with ethnicity, one of the things on one side was that actually a lot of data on ethnicity is not collected. So there must be like uh, patients that we don't have the data for. So that's one of the things that makes it more challenging because we're missing a bit of sometimes 20% of what are their background. And because there are interesting differences and they, it gives us like really an overview of the population. That's one of the things. And also, as you say, when we started, we had, for example, small samples. So you have on the technical side to actually cluster groups that in an ideal world, we want to actually have 
for example, Black Caribbean distinguished from Black African, which in, in mental health services research we are able to do, but for example, in the COVID-19 response at some point, we couldn't make that granularity of difference. Uh, but so uh, it's a really good point and, and uh, you know, uh, uh, there is some missing data. Thank you very much. I'd like to actually very briefly call on one of our colleagues, Barbara Arroyo, who's our uh, uh, Chief Clinical Information Officer in South London and Maudsley. Barbara, do you want to comment a little bit on demographic uh, re recording and accuracy of demographic recording in clinical notes? So I, I think we are getting better. I think as we um, understand the importance of it and how much it means to people and how much we can then personalize care, improve access, you know, and, and, and tailor, you know, care and, and treatment and so on, I think we are getting better. So it's like a feedback loop. The more important we know that this data is, I think clinicians will get better at it. And what we're doing, you know, from my perspective as a digital clinician, is trying to make our systems as easy as possible for people to capture this information. Uh, for example, when, you, when people are first referred to our services or in, in their routine reviews, so it doesn't feel like an add-on because that's when things can sometimes not be completely accurate or be forgotten or people might have changed some, some of their um, personal contact details or, or you know they might have different views about how they want to be addressed, et cetera. So I suppose we're trying to work with clinicians and with people to document this and, and to use it as, as, as well as possible. Great, thanks very much, Barbara. A question for you, Dippin, and I think you answered this a little bit, but just to speak a bit more on this point. Cogstax is a great innovation, but has become a little overhyped as it's not a magic bullet solution. What have you done to manage, or what do you plan to do, to manage clinicians' expectations and explain the limitations of the Cogstax approach? Uh, yeah, so um, as part of our journey, I think right from the, the start with, with that sort of stepwise manner um, in regards to the design and the development, we've tried to incorporate um, a wide group of stakeholders uh, right right from the start so that um, those sorts of issues are addressed um, as early as possible. One of those, as I've said, is that uh, d this is a, a decision support tool. Um, so right from the very start, we are keen to ensure that all of our uh, healthcare professional users are aware that this is not taking over de the decision-making process, that the discretion still remains with them. Um, but it, the idea is, is to support um, the, the care that they offer to, to patients under their care. Um, and, and the other is, um, particularly when there's so many different platforms and um, systems, and sometimes those systems don't talk to each other always, we've, again, tried to uh, have uh, awareness of um, the way that Cogstack can link into other programs. Um, we're, for example, introducing electronic prescribing um, at, at our trust currently, uh, and we're keen to ensure that there is a capability to link Cogstack up to the various other systems, hopefully to, to provide a more um, uniform, uniformed manner by which uh, alerts are sent out rather than having multiple different systems, which, which can perhaps over bombard uh, users and then lead to uh, less uh, take up of those systems that are available. Exactly. So it's all the chance of implementing this into practice. Really, really nice. And actually another comment in the chat there, decision re remains with the clinician and also accountability. And what you've been doing, Dippin, is, is, is um, working with the diabetologists and to um, agree a guideline for, for management of abnormal blood sugars uh, within the hospital trust, which is then the standard management, and this is being, uh, you know, so depending on how high your blood sugar is, that that is the bit of information that sort of people are sort of connected to direct, uh, uh, given directly. So it's, it's it's directing people to guidance, and and yeah. so really nice questions. It's 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 it, what you've been doing is superb, uh, and really fabulous. Um, Lan or Catherine, do you have any comments on on that? From the patient to public point of view about the expectations. I I actually don't. Sorry, Fiona. No, you're all right. No, it's great. Thank you very much, and um, uh, for this. And we've um, yes, and somebody's asking another question about in healthy inequalities. And I think you're absolutely right. And to echo what Rebecca and Barbara were saying earlier, is is uh, you know the the. The recording is good, but not perfect. So in, in, improving that all the time will be hugely important. Now, I think we're just coming up to the, um, the uh, time here now. 
uh, for uh, our, our next talk. And it means, and I'm very pleased to welcome uh, my colleague, Dr. Mark Ashworth. And he, Mark is a reader in primary care and particularly expert in primary care informatics. And uh, he's, re he's reader in uh, King's College London and, uh, and works um, as a, a general practitioner in Lambeth. And Mark is going to tell us uh, a, a little bit about how health data is protected, which of course is hugely important um, for, for any work like this. So Mark, welcome and thank you very much. And just before we start to say a, a final, but not our complete final, thank you to all the speakers so far. Uh, you, you've all been fantastic. Thank you very much. Fiona, thank you very much for the introduction. And I think the very first starting point for this is a clinical starting point. Now I'm aware that some of you on this call will be clinicians, some of you won't be clinicians, but to everybody, a reminder that patient confidentiality is sacred. It is absolutely sacred. It is so sacred that I will lose my job if there is any breach of patient confidentiality. That applies to my clinical work, that applies to my research work. Yeah. And for anybody who is not clinical, let me tell you that patient confidentiality is really strict. If you've got a patient with epilepsy, you know they're driving, you can't just report them to DVLA and say, look, there's somebody who is a complete liability, they've got epilepsy, uh, they're going to cause a crash and kill somebody. There's a whole process to go through before you can release any information about that patient. And only when you have tried everything possible working with the patient to point out the dangers, and discuss the dangers and aware of their mental capacity, do you have, uh, are you at all able to tell DVLA? So I, I tell you that story so that you know that patient confidentiality is paramount and that principle applies to how we handle patient data for research purposes. Now the abiding principle for all uh, data analysis using patient level data are the eight Caldecott pr uh, principles. You'll be delighted to know I've got absolutely no PowerPoint slides on this at all and I could plow through all eight uh, principles with you. But I want you to know that those two are sacred principles and we do plow through them. You can just Google uh, eight principles of Caldecott. If your Google is old, you'll find there's only seven principles. If your Google is new, you'll find that an eighth has now been added. And the basis of these is, again, that patient confidentiality is paramount and no work with data must ever lead to accidental re-identification of any patients. And so all the data I work with has to be completely anonymized or have other or all possible identifiers removed so that it is impossible for me to know which patient this data refers to. And it's only the minimum data possible required. That again is one of the Caldecott principles. And I can't be the judge of whether the data is sufficiently secure. I've got a conflict of interest. I want to get my hands on data because I'm a researcher. That might mean that as far as the public is concerned, do they really know they can entrust their data with me working on their anonymized data? The answer is I cannot work on any data unless the relevant Caldecott guardian has approved my use of the data. And I have a ghastly long form. I say ghastly because it takes me ages to complete each one, but it's about 32 pages plus uh, going over all eight Caldecott guardian principles, how I will protect that data. It is so important. Uh, that my own role is regulated. The Caldecott, I cannot get any data until the Caldecott Guardian. In my case, it's Dr. Ruth Hutt, who is Director of Public Health for Lambeth, who has to scrutinise my application. And I think the final thing to say about um, data security is it is possible to get it wrong. Some people 
even the NHS gets it wrong. You'll probably remember back in 2013-14, there was the care dot data fiasco. And the care dot data fiasco was going to be to use this tremendous NHS asset of NHS data. And David Cameron had this wonderful plan that it would be an asset which would boost our scientific capability in the UK. Great idea. Um, and that you could earn some money from it by uh, allowing pharma industry, the pharmaceutical industry, access to the data. Um, less good idea. I think people were not very enamoured of the idea that their data could be sold to pharmaceutical companies without their consent. Uh, there are also problems with how the data was removed from practices in a way that possibly was identifiable. And so that whole plan came tumbling down and we now have, as a result, additional hoops to go through in order to access the data. And I think one of the principles that we apply, I'm research lead for Lambeth DataNet, it's anonymized primary care data from Lambeth. One of the key principles is the data belongs to the patients, the patients who provided the data in the first place. And for that reason, we have a duty to report our findings back to patients. So that really important loop, how are you using my data? What did you get out of it? Um, we, we allowed you access to your data. In return, we'd like to know how you use the data. And so there's a really important part of the research I'm involved in building up this community asset called L Lambeth DataNet, which involves me working with Lambeth Health Watch and feeding back the results of our data analysis to the local population. And I think on that note, perhaps that's the right point to stop and open things up to discussion. Thank you very much. That's that's really helpful, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, there, we're we're going to go into our breakout sessions now in a moment. But I think I thought it was really important to have have um, you comment on that before we do that. We have one question. Uh, Nezrin, would you like to? Ask Hi. One question thank you. Um, um, thank you, Dr. Ashford. But my experience as a patient and carer of about regarding the the day my data and the person I care's data it's been quite uh, unfortunately um, opposite um, I we were I can give you a couple of examples I was at uh, any one day and uh, with my with my, the person I care and someone researcher approached about the uh, HIV testing or something like that presumably because I am foreigner or something they targeted I have no idea but I was sitting in there and then I obliged because I wanted to be helpful and next time I know all my uh, each time I went to hospital for anything first thing came my test result even though it was negative it's besides the point you know I was that data wasn't protected as far as I'm concerned. Secondly, um, uh, I didn't give um, permission for my GP to share my data, <laughs> but uh, whenever there is something, everyone seems to be able to access it. So I have no idea. I haven't given permission for data to be per um, shared, but everybody shares it. Uh, so regardless of my uh, many attempts, I. I always experience that that it, anyone can sort of like see my backgrounds and stuff like that. I have nothing to hide and it's helpful probably for my care. But the point is, I didn't give permission. Does that make sense? And the reason I didn't give permission, because I, exactly this, I'm not, I am worried where my da data will go. I don't mind about the clinicians and the, you know, people who look after us, but, you know, you hear all sorts of things about data breaches and you know selling data and stuff like that. So I just wanted to point my experiences to you. Thank you. Thank you. That is an extremely helpful but rather worrying account. I'm really sorry to hear of your own experience. Let me try and give a brief answer. That is that for the purposes of direct clinical care, I'm choosing my words carefully. For the purposes of direct clinical care, data is available and shared between providers, between an ambulance trust, um, a hospital trust, 
and a GP practice. For the purposes of research, it is very, very different. And there is no access to the data uh, except in an anonymized form. And if you don't wish any of your data to leave the practice at all, there is a system uh, called informed dissent. And you simply have to write, notify the practice, write to the practice manager and say, I do not want my records ever used for research purposes. Um, I'd like an informed dissent code to be put on my records. And that will mean that people like me can never use your record for any kind of research, even though the research I do is never financed by um, a pharmaceutical company or industry or anything private. It's only fi financed by the NHS or the Medical Research Council. So that is the way that information is shared for direct clinical care, but is not shared if it's against your wishes for research purposes. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both very much. And that's very helpful. Thank you for the question. And Mark, thank you very much for an excellent explanation. That's really good. We're now going to break out into uh, our breakout sessions, which lasted about 20 minutes. The uh, topics are the, that we're working around are at the bottom of your program page and you and we have uh, somebody uh, leading each group and we also have hopefully some note takers in each group but if there isn't might you make sure just make sure there's some a note taker at the moment because not every group might have a note taker we might need to nominate somebody and uh the so um and uh we're oh, hoping that if you can to turn on your cameras if you if you if you can't that's fine too um there won't be time for everybody to introduce themselves individually uh but people can introduce themselves during this discussion and uh as they speak uh, and, uh, and we'll see you in a little while thank you very much thank you thank you And uh, we certainly had a really interesting and lively conversation in our group. And, uh, and thank you all for doing that. Now, it would be great if some of um, the groups could feedback uh, from the, uh, the point, some of the points that were made uh, during their conversations. Um, could I ask for a volunteer to go first? Refik. I, I can I can go from our group if that's if Thank that's all right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Much appreciated. <laughs> and apologies, my my camera's not working. Um, so we it was a, it was it was a really good discussion. Um, we touched on on the absolute importance of um, of collaboration and how that's been such a big feature of what we've been talking about today uh, of of patient involvement and use, service user involvement in this. Um, we, we spoke about the power of, of what this is, which is using data which is already being collected, the importance of thinking about health literacy and communicating with, with service users and, and, and research participants in, in a way that makes sense to, to them. So thinking about, thinking about the audience, um, thinking about how we, could, how we can communicate the, the benefits of, of involvement more effectively. Um, we also spoke about um, the importance of, of understanding um, trust or potential lack of trust um, among service users um, uh, and a real strong voice for um, uh, 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 the anxieties that many that many service users have about where their where their data may be going and how it might be used so uh, a feeling that perhaps we're, we're still not um, uh, communicating effectively around the assurances that that uh, that people want to hear about the, the the safety of their of their data. I think that that that, that covered most of the things I, I wrote down, but the the, the 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 discussion was a bit wider than that as well. Obviously, well, Vita, excellently. Thank you very much, Refik, for summarizing that, summarizing that so nicely. Vita, you chaired brilliantly. As you have you anything else you'd like to add to that? You're on mute. 
Thank you, you very much, Rafik, for that and Fiona as well, and everyone in the group. Um, uh, no, I don't think I have anything to add, but I think uh, the the points that kind of uh, stuck in from our discussion is the need for clarity, transparency, accountability, and uh, these are the basis for trust between the two parts, the patients and the researchers. And this is the way that we should, this is what we should work on in order to, to, to create a better foundation for data collection and then use. Thank you. Very true. Could we, could we invite somebody from another group now to give us some feedback? Have we any chairs or note, note takers from the other groups? Clive, did I see you put your hand up there? Uh, Oh. No. Um, I can I can attempt if you'd like. Melissa, thank you. Yes, please. <laughs> of course. Um, so our group we discussed um sort of how health data can be used to address health inequalities, what areas we should be targeting, and how researchers should engage with the public. Um, and it was brought up that sort of um a lot of focus is given on serious illnesses, which is obviously very important. Um, and quite a few of the examples in these talks as well will fall into diagnoses around psychosis and bipolar. And um, eating disorder tends to be, uh, ten do tend to be quite um, missed in some cases and overlooked, despite being considered a seri serious mental disorder quite, as well. Um, and it's also very easy to, to then overlook physical health problems or patients who present with multiple problems. So the idea is how we can then use the information that we gather um, to assist these people and whether these resources would be able to be sensitive enough to help those who can be helped um, without causing like uh, any further issues for an individual's use of their own data. Um, uh, da, da, da. And this could also be used to help primary care colleagues and uh, marginalized patients who often, come, who often struggle coming forward with eating issues as well. Um, so the idea is, is that for engagement purposes, audiences tend to be interested in place-based conversations. Um, and so it might be a good idea to sort of do engagement on a local area to attract community interest um, as something more locally available is more relevant to an individual and then easier for them to understand um, in so strict way. So it's not quite as nebulous as um, more national or even global strategies that might be used. Um, and it also provides opportunities for researchers to then show that they're interested in the people who are in front of them as individuals and sort of the area that they live and work in, as opposed to just viewing them sort of as numbers or something. Um, and it would also be a great idea to frame it as relevant for individuals in particular um, and make, showing it that, showing ways that it can assist their uh, conditions as is and not just sort of something that is irrelevant to them as individuals. Um, I, we just sort of concluded that it's best to remember the individual first and foremost. Uh, sorry, I've said that word so often. <laughs> um, You've had, but, but it's very important. Uh, the, the, the person um, and who they are, where they live, and what we can do for them. That's really key. Beautifully summarised. Thank you very much, Melissa. I think, and I think that you know that's that's really important feedback. Does do we have any comments from the other groups? I think we had a number number of groups. Here, reflecting on that. So I think just listening to you speak, Melissa, and, and reflecting back from so, so, some of the conversations earlier as well, there's some of the advantages, of course, of uh, huge advantages of, of, of this is that is that is that uh, you can inform the use informatics to inform the care of people who might not sign up to a traditional research project, but that if things are anonymized, then actually they um, they will, uh, you will be able to, do, to answer questions that are hugely relevant to care, their care pathways and how best to help people get good outcomes. So particularly when people are, are very um, significantly ill, uh, particularly with mental health problems, for example, is one, one example I come across, is that they, they may be too ill to sign up to, to many research projects, not all some of which will be adapted, but, um, the uh, use of applied informatics research and particularly anonymized observational databases allows us to answer questions we wouldn't otherwise be able to answer and, uh, and make sure that our interventions, et cetera, are tailored 
better. So I think it's it's you know it's an, it's always it's really important that you're raising the fact that you know not not all the groups have been mentioned today. Of course, we have too much to say, but that multi mobility work etc. that Rebecca gave earlier is, is is a big example of that. Uh, very few people have just one one thing that ails them. Uh, many people have have, have a, a number of different things and and add add a complexity to the system. Have we got some feedback from some of the other groups? So, would there be, be somebody to call on? Sa Savvy, were you sitting in a group? Uh, yes, uh, shall, I, shall I go next? Um, this, um, I, I will just touch on um, two or three of the points because we um, had quite a wide ranging discussion. And but um, uh, just to uh, assure everybody, all, I think we're, all, all of the note takers will be typing or will hopefully be typing up our notes and feeding them back so they will inform the the arc. Um, so we, we looked at um, some of the ways in which decisions were made about what would be researched. And uh, in some instances, um, there is very active uh, uh, involvement by patient and public contributors in that process of, um, uh, of uh, deciding on the re research. Um, in other places, there may be, um, the, the, there may be some room for improvement, um, but certainly having the, this data available means that there's a, a rich amount of information that can be used um, and by identifying issues and gaps, I mean that there were ex examples given, it's possible to meet needs that are currently unmet, um, for instance for the black cancer patients who may, may not be getting adequate peer support and so forth. So, I, um, so we looked at some of those, que some of those questions about developing um, the um, input of patients, carers, and communities, especially those particularly disadvantaged in um, use in use of data for research. Um, we looked at the question of communication, um, for instance, um, how much do, is communicated about um, the the, the um, uh, about pharma, is there too much suspicion of pharma? So some people may th think there is, so there may be varying views, but that may affect um, people's um, in input. So that, that's one area of communication, but there, there are also issues of communication more widely about, um, for, for in, uh, uh, um, and it, that there was also the question about communication um, to clinicians and others about what's happening locally, how data can be used in that way. There were also questions about whether quality of life type data, patient reported outcomes and so on, could be linked with other kinds of measures such as ethnicity to get a broader picture of, of patients, which could then be used in research that tackled inequalities. That's just a, an example of some of the questions that we talked about. Very nice. Thank you very much. And and you mentioned the, you know, you got back to communication and that came up in our group as well about trust and uh, huge, you know, and, and that really helping engagement and, and, um, and it being a sort of circle. The better you communicate, the better the trust, the better the understanding of the benefits, etc. Beautifully put. Thank you very much, Savvy. Uh, Dina, have you anybody from your group? Yes, hello everyone. So um, we just discussed that um, uh, there, there was one concern raised about um, uh, pharmaceutical companies accessing uh, uh, data and uh, patients' data. And we thought that maybe guarantee, like, um, uh, guaranteeing the, the, the patients and service users that um, uh, their data will not be accessible, like uh, no one will access their data on, on, unless the researchers will um, uh, will make them like uh, want to 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 uh, get involved in in the research and we also discussed that maybe to encourage them to be involved in the research maybe it's good it's a good idea to um, uh, to go back to them and tell them about the fun and the findings of the projects rather than just um, uh, making them um, uh, uh, want to, to to be part of the project but also um, uh, uh, going back to them and tell them about the findings of the projects and um, and how their 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 data uh, were used. 
Very good. Thank you very much, Dina. Mariana, did you have a group? Yes, so in my group, uh, there was someone who was taking uh, quite detailed notes, but there was a very interesting discussion okay. around um, whether we should uh, use initiatives like these, the, these webinars to reach out to the public to show how uh, good data can do. Uh, so really so to raise awareness and maybe like to deconstruct sometimes concerns that exist about how data is used and at the same time there were other views about um, patient safety and patients confidentiality so it was very interesting navigating between these uh, two uh, sides uh, but I think the overall message was uh, raise awareness that data can do good to improve patient care. So I think we may need to stop now, but I want to thank everybody for coming uh, because it's been really helpful to hear from you all. And hopefully we will be able to show you just a little bit. I've actually, there's quite a lot of work going on across the collaboration because we are very, very lucky in that our partners across South London have a huge range of um, informatics uh, in development and, uh, and have some fantastic tools. And of course, this is all about how that uh, can get into practice how we can use things like um, uh, observational data to better understand inequalities, to feed that back into the system. And Rebecca gave that lovely example about how that happened at, happened at pace during COVID to really sort of inform and, and, and change practice very quickly. But the idea of all of this is that we'll get meaningful information back to decision makers, back to, to patients and the public so, and, and back to clinicians so that we're able to improve the level of care we offer the, and hopefully improve people's lives. Uh, there's also uh, 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 Dippin and Catherine and Lana spoke very nicely about uh, the uh, electronic clinical decision support system that we're just introducing for the first time into mental health settings and a really simple thing, just that, um, uh, HbA1c, you're, you're basically a, a sugar measure to see how can we prompt good care and how does that go down in real life? Uh, what are the pitfalls? What do we need to know? Do people like it? Do people use it? Does it help? All these things we've yet, yet to learn. And it's great to have your input in that. And, uh, and, and to thank uh, uh, for both, thank for both those presentations, but also to thank Mark for explaining how your data is protected and to, to thank Mariana and Bartek as well for, uh, for showing you about around our hub and how that uh, is designed to sort of showcase all the different um, opportunities, uh, the different tools, the different uh, systems, informatic systems that we have available across, uh, um, across South London, and that we're now expanding the patient and public engagement pages and the capacity building pages in order to be able to um, engage with, with people across South London better, to hear more from you about how we can do this better, and to, and to hope to set up further collaborations, because that's the, the name of the game in the arc. So just to finish up now, and thank you very much, please do um, uh, reply to the poll that's hopefully just popped up on your screen as well as on mine, and uh, I will take that for feedback for the future. And it's been really helpful, and thank you very, very much.